Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear colleagues, good evening. My name is Noura Al Qasimi, consultant in medical retina and uveitis, vice president of Emirates Society of Ophthalmology. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to attend uh, this evening's meeting, and I'm delighted to chair and launch the consensus of Emirates Society of Ophthalmology consensus of di diabetic macular edema management. On behalf of ESO, I would like to uh, announce that uh, our um, work, hard work, full of challenges, but we have a unified one aim, which is to be uh, to have a single unified national guideline, uh, a consensus made up of a great initiative and um, more than uh, 250, uh, around 300 uh, copies that it will be uh, reached to you, uh, to all the ophthalmologists uh, with the new AE. So uh, we are proudly saying that it will be uh, the first unif unified uh, guideline uh, regarding the uh, diabetic macular edema. Um, to, to walk you through the uh, consensus, uh, we had a great efforts uh, by our a great uh, uh, committee, which, uh, which are made of uh, 15 retina uh, pi uh, eminent speakers here in, uh, within UAE. And uh, let me uh, take you uh, through this consensus uh, by uh, inviting and uh, welcoming uh, my dear colleagues, the retina specialist, uh, who worked so hard on this consensus and will share with you highlighting uh, the, uh, the, uh, the most um, uh, important information within the consensus, followed by uh, question and answers. So if you have any question, please uh, write your question in the Q&A answer, and then we will um, answer uh, accordingly after the consensus. So we'll start the presentation uh, with the, uh, first of all, about Emirates Society of Ophthalmology, which is, uh, it is um, made of and formed by pioneering UAE ophthalmologists as society within Emirates Medical Association. It is well collaborating with uh, um, eminent health organization, the, uh, our, uh, regarding our uh, um, our retina specialists in the country, they are uh, as uh, as I said, we uh, we were uh, fifteen uh, retina specialists, um, uh, a collection of uh, Saha, Dubai Health Authority, uh, Ministry of Health, governmental and private. They have made considerable effort and consensus by writing uh, and editing the guidelines based on international guideline studies and cl a clinical trial. So let me introduce you and have uh, um, uh, to, uh, to introduce you to our uh, speakers who are who will take you later on through uh, the consensus. Dr. Igor Kozak, who is a consultant veterinary surgeon at Morfield's Eye Hospital, Abu Dhabi. Dr. Maison Al Karam, she's a retina specialist and head of the cultural committee of uh, Emirates Society of Ophthalmology. Dr. Pierre George Uneri, who is a consultant in medical retina and uh, the uh, the head of the uveitis um, uh, department in Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Dr. Patricio Adoris uh, Lorenzo, who is a consultant in medical retina and head of ophthalmology department in Dubai Hospital. Dr. Ala Atawan, he's a consultant ophthalmologist, veteran retinal surgeon at Tawam Hospital. Dr. Muhammad Awadallah, he is a consultant uh, veterinary surgeon, Dr. Ahmed Al-Khashab. He's a consultant in medical and surgical retina. Dr. Muhammad Abdel Nabi, he's a consultant veterinary surgeon and head of uh, ophthalmology department at Sheikh Shakhbout Medical City. Dr. Ammar Safar, he is a consultant veterinary surgeon, medical director at Moorfields Eye Hospital, Dubai. Dr. Rahanan Shamsi, she's a consultant medical retina and head of ophthalmology department at Tawam Hospital. Dr. Prasan Rao, he's a consultant VR surgeon. He is the medical director of Midcare Eye Center, Dubai. Dr. Madav Rao, he's a consultant VR surgeon, Burjil Hospital, Abu Dhabi. Dr. Amr Farid, consultant ophthalmologist, Maghribi Eye Hospital. The last but not least, Dr. Avinash Gorbaksani, he is a consultant, medical retina and uveitis at Moorfields Eye Hospital, Dubai. Those are a collective of eminent uh, speakers who worked so hard, uh, more than uh, 18 months, uh, more than 70 uh, emails back and forth. Um, and many uh, drafts has be, have been uh, circulated among us. 
uh, also uh, two we uh, we uh, we recruited two medical writers and even a couple of uh, face to face meeting and due to covid we turned our meetings uh, virtually uh, and uh, also we have to acknowledge the contribution of professor Ahmad Abud who had uh, rev who revised uh, the guidelines and agreed on the content itself so before starting the uh, uh, consensus, we have to clarify that these guidelines are made by retinal specialists based on international guideline studies, clinical practice, and has been fully acknowledged. The authors of the consensus have been considerable efforts to ensure that the information upon which it is based on accurate and up to date. We have uh, gone to great lengths to, in, uh, to ensure that all information in the guideline, as well as medication referred to, is correct and actual. However, this does not assume any responsibility of, uh, for potential errors or complications arising from relying or and applying uh, the information contained herein. The author accepts no responsibility for any inaccuracies, information perceived as misleading, or the success of or failure for any treatment regimen detailed in the guideline. Uh, and the last but not least important information that uh, the consensus carries no commercial or conflict of interest which exists. Anyhow, so we'll start with the first speaker who is Dr. Uh, Hanan Shamsi and, uh, and then we'll go through. Dr. Hanan? Good evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Noura, for um, this initiative and um, for inviting us to be part of this um, um, achievement. Um, I'm going to discuss uh, five points. Um, I'll start with the prevalence of diabetes in United Arab Emirates. As we know, uh, diabetes mellitus is a growing global challenge. Um, the WHO estimated in 2016 that approximately one in 12 adults were affected with diabetes. The International Diabetes Federation statistics reported diabetes prevalence rate of 16.3% for adult population in the United Arab Emirates aged between 20 to 79 years. Uh, similar um, data were also reported by a Waqaya screening program in the Emirates of Abu Dhabi in uh, 2008 to between 2008 and 2010 reported 17.6% uh, adult diabetic and 27% uh, pre-diabetic. So we really uh, are facing um, uh, a huge number and a task on us, and uh, that will keep us all busy uh, managing uh, diabetic macular edema and all the complication of diabetes. Uh, we touched on uh, an important definition to make it uh, standardized and uh, easy to communicate with uh, other, our colleagues. Um, the traditional classic uh, teaching uh, clinically significant macular edema. And uh, then we focused on the a newly um, a new definition after the era of OCT uh, to make it more easy and practical um, in order to be able to treat or not to treat patients. Uh, so the central involving macular edema is uh, the retinal thickening um, of the central subfield, which is one millimeter in diameter on uh, the OCT, uh, which uh, validate the treatment, and the non-central involving macular uh, diabetic macular edema, which is outside uh, the central subfield. Um, a treatment uh, pre-requisites, um, um, the recommendation is to do uh, to check visual acuity, uh, intraocular pressure, and um, do an OCT uh, before uh, initiation of treatment as a baseline. And then after the loading dose, uh, um, and after that, every, every visit, uh, because as we know, uh, vision and IUB is one of our vital sign in ophthalmology. Uh, fundus fluorescein angiography, um, the recommendation is to do it before initiation of treatment, to diagnose uh, ischemia, and to discuss with your patient uh, the visual prognosis based on the finding, and to be repeated according to individualized case. So the important question is, when should we treat? Um, based on the international um, uh, uh, guidelines, 
uh, we treat uh, patient with um, a visual acuity of uh, 20, uh, 20, 30 or worse with a central uh, uh, macular edema uh, of a thickness of uh, 300 micron or more. Uh, there are special cases when patients are symptomatic but uh, does not fit those criteria, uh, which should be uh, tackled individually between the physician and uh, their doctors. Uh, general guideline in diabetic macular edema, as we understand, when we treat patient, we treat patient as a whole. Um, uh, so uh, we should not only focus on uh, on the eye. We should uh, standardize all and optimize all systemic uh, parameters like hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia, renal impairment. Uh, we should also review frequently patient medication because. Um, uh, as we know, uh, some of uh, the medication would um, increase the um, diabetic macular edema. Um, uh, most importantly, while we are doing this, we should not withhold or deny the treatment from patient. So both should be started um, at the same time. Um, we should start and initiate our uh, treatment for diabetic ma macular edema along with the um, um, looking at the systemic uh, association which affect uh, the diabetes and the diabetic macular edema in particular. Um, this is my part and I'm giving the floor for my the next speaker. Thank you. Edema, uh... It is noted that macular laser is no longer a primary uh, treatment, and uh, this has been replaced by intravitreal anti-VEGF treatment, uh, uh, unless contraindicated in some cases. Steroid implants, especially dexamethasone implant, can be used as a first-line treatment in cases of contraindications of anti-VEGF. It is very important to monitor intraocular pressure when using uh, dexamethasone implants. Uh, dexamethasone implants is specially suited for eyes that have been vitrectomized in patients with pseudophagia or in cases of chronic diabetic macular edema. It is very important to discuss the treatment plan with patients. Uh, for anti-angiogenic intravitreal therapy, we have several accepted uh, uh, options, and these include fixed uh, treatment, uh, which is usually monthly treatment, pro-renata treatment, which uh, responds to uh, either visual or anatomic uh, decline, and uh, treat and extend uh, protocol. Uh, only licensed and approved anti-VGF agents must be used, and these include aflibercept and ranibizumab in the UAE. Biosimilars uh, are not allowed or any other imported agents. Uh, all patients uh, treated with anti-VGF uh, should follow a uh, loading dose, which uh, consists of three to five injections, after which the treatment response is assessed. Um, and based on the treatment response, uh, which includes anatomic and functional uh, parameters, we uh, continue with the treatment. It is estimated that in the first year of treatment, we use eight to nine anti-VEGF injections. In the second year, it may be five to six. Uh, um, we, after loading those, we assess the response to anti-VGF treatment. Uh, for poor response, we uh, count patients who uh, fail to gain at least five letters of vision on visual acuity chart or fail to reduce central retinal thickness by 10%. In the cases like that, we recommend to switch to another anti-VGF agent or to steroid intravitreal uh, implant. For relapsing uh, diabetic macular edema, which is defined by diabetic macular edema, which responds to treatment. However, when untreated, it comes back after uh, a certain period of time, defined as one year. Uh, we again advocate for uh, uh, restarting the treatment process, which can include anti-VEGF agents or dexamethasone implant. Refractory diabetic macular edema is defined as macular edema that is not responding to full course of anti-VGF agents or steroid implants. A combination therapy is allowed 
uh, and the referral to retina surgeons to assess and or treat uh, conditions such as epiretinal membrane or vitreomacular retraction confirmed by OCT is recommended. Good evening, everyone. Um, hi, uh, this is Dr. Ahmed Khasheb. Um, I would like first to uh, thank uh, ISO for uh, the great initiative and especially Dr. Anura for her uh, great effort. So I'm, I will be talking about the anti-VGF contraindications. And we have a general rule if there is any uh, infection, uh, any intravitreal injection should be postponed, any eye infection. Uh, but specifically for the anti-VGF, uh, we should not give any anti-VGF uh, um, uh, injection when we have uh, um, any recent myocardial infarction or stroke for a minimum of three months. Uh, anti-VGF uh, treatment uh, uh, is also uh, contraindicated uh, in uh, pregnancy or breastfeeding uh, uh, ladies. Uh, in such cases, a steroid should be uh, the treatment of choice, and we have two options, which is uh, the uh, dexamethasone as a first line in such cases. Um, so the, for dexamethasone implant, the estimated number of injections is usually three to four injections over uh, 12 months. Uh, in case of good response, and if the DME recurrence is less frequent than every six months, it is recommended to continue with dexamethasone implant. Be aware that the dexamethasone does not usually last for more than uh, four months with a peak effect at six to eight weeks. And this is a point of uh, notice uh, when there is a uh, repeated recurrence. In case of frequent recurrence of fluid less than three months after dexamethasone implant, this needs further discussion and switch maybe to anti-VGF instead. However, if the patient is not keen to receive an implant every four months, it is recommended to consider switching to flucinolone uh, implant, eluvin implant. Um, prior to flucinolone uh, implant, a steroid challenge may be considered if we did not give an uh, initial dexamethasone or other dex implant beforehand. Um, uh, um, and this challenge can be either with dexamethasone implant or with topical uh, steroid eye drops as an alternative in uh, uh, compliant patients. Not every responder to dexamethasone implant will respond to flu flucinolone implant. Top-up treatment may be required in addition to the flu flucinolone implant, including anti-VEGF and sometimes dexamethasone uh, implant during the course of the treatment, sometimes early and sometimes later during the course of the treatment. Around 10% of patients treated with dexamethasone implant will have an IOP increase of more than 25 milligram uh, millimeter of mercury. If a patient develops elevated uh, IOP with dexamethasone implant, it is not recommended to use uh, the longer acting flu flucinolone implant. Contraindications of dexamethasone and uh, flucinolone uh, acetonide intravitreal implants uh, are eyes with active or suspected ocular or periocular infection, advanced glaucoma requiring more than three medications, non intact posse capsule. Uh, when there is um, um, implantation of the IOL, whether in T-chamber or on remnants of the uh, posterior capsule or rexes. Uh, this is uh, not including YAG capsulotomy because now the, eye, the lens is well centered in the back. Uh, hypersensitivity to dexamethasone implant and or plusinolone acetonide intravitreal uh, implant. Thank you very much. All right, so basically I will be discussing the special circumstances that we might actually face uh, when using anti-VEGF medications. One of those uh, special conditions or special circumstances are when we are presented with advanced cases where we have diabetic macular edema as well as PDR or pro proliferative diabetic retinopathy. The committee finds that uh, in these circumstances, it is still recommended to use uh, uh, an anti-VEGF agent as a first line of therapy uh, in treating patients who have center involving DME uh, is the, uh, in the in the uh, context of PDR. In the case that there is non-center involving DME, then at that point, P, uh, PRP can also be uh, used uh, by itself without the use of the uh, anti-VEGF. It is very important to highlight that the committee still uh, uh, recommends that uh, panretinal photocoagulation remains the gold standard 
uh, treatment for the proliferative diabetic retinopathy, uh, while anti-VEGF also and a combination of anti-VEGF and PRP can be considered in certain uh, cases because both treatments are actually licensed treatments for the management of uh, PDR. So uh, cases in general that have a combination of PDR and center involving uh, DME should be uh, started with a uh, anti-VEGF therapy and PRP can also be considered at a later stage. Once the macular edema is uh, stabilized, then uh, patients can actually receive a full PRP at that point. So this is a very uh, common uh, situation that we actually uh, face uh, in our clinics. Another potential circumstance where you have a patient who has a significant cataract and also has a center invo involving uh, uh, diabetic macular edema. And how do we deal with this? Uh, the recommendation from the committee is to actually stabilize the retina first with the use of anti-VEGF uh, therapy first, and then uh, moving on to um, the uh, uh, cataract surgery in one to two weeks later. You can actually uh, also inject a, a steroid implant, or you can do that before surgery or uh, during surgery. There are studies that go uh, either way, but uh, uh, the recommendation as stated above. How about cases when you have fibrovascular membranes and traction retinal detachment? It's a recommendation of the committee that if there is diabetic macular edema, along with traction, significant traction, that actually threatens or involves the center of the macula, it, as the patient has to be actually uh, referred to a vitreoretinal retinal surgeon to consider uh, a surgery, and at that point, Anti-VEGF therapy should be considered only in the context of preparing for vitrectomy, so basically a week or two maximum before uh, preparing for surgery. Other uh, conditions that can actually fall under this is basically having epiretinal membrane or having v VMT, vitreo macular traction, along with vitreous hemorrhage uh, uh, in patients who have significant center involving DME. Those were all recommended to be transferred to uh, the care of a VR surgeon. Another thing that was mentioned earlier by my uh, colleague, Dr. Khashab, is the uh, case of a pregnancy. It is not recommended to use anti uh, injections during pregnancy. Uh, if uh, uh, needed and if the edema is very significant, then in the second or third trimester of the pregnancy, a steroid uh, implant might be uh, considered. Also, laser could be considered in cases uh, that do not involve the uh, center of the fovea. But in general, during pregnancy, it is preferred not to use any medications, if at all possible, and wait until the end of the pregnancy. Thank you so much. This concludes my part, and Dr. Ala Atwan is next. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Amar, um, uh, for that thorough um, uh, short uh, briefing. Um, my part, um, just waiting for my slides to come up. I want to make sure that everyone hears me. Meanwhile, I would like to congratulate um, myself and uh, the whole committee members for this achievement after all this hard work. Um, so, thank you. So, um, now I will be covering three main points uh, in this slide. Um, uh, bilateral injections, um, uh, bitidine iodine, uh, and the injecting room. As far as the bilateral injections is concerned, um, it's at the surgeon's discretion to decide whether they can inject unilaterally or bilaterally uh, in the cases of bilateral diabetic macular edema. Uh, of course, uh, you are going to have to explain to the patient very well, as we always do, whether it's unilateral or bilateral, all the risks and benefits involved in this uh, uh, procedure. Um, doing bilateral procedure does not necessarily increase the risk of endophthalmitis, uh, but it's a matter of um, exposing the patient to this risk twice um, as, as we are injecting both eyes. Um, we have to take all precautions um, uh, possible. Uh, every eye should be treated as a separate patient. So you have to prep, clean, uh, use a, a different vial if a different, of a different patch number of the medication you're using uh, for every eye and you treat every eye as a separate patient, uh, that's mandatory. The role of uh, the use of iodine, 5% iodine in the fornix, we recommend using 5% iodine uh, in the fornix for 60 seconds is recommended. Uh, now we know that there is a, a lot of general guidelines there, you know, European and others that will say 30 seconds is sufficient. Uh, but we do have enough evidence um, uh, to suggest uh, that 60 seconds has better uh, sterilizing outcome uh, in comparison to 30 seconds. Uh, and there is no statistical difference between 60 seconds and three minutes. 
Um, so 60 seconds is what we recommend. In cases of clear allergy to iodine, then uh, chlorhexidine 0.1% uh, can be used instead. Now, caution uh, and warning of endophthalmitis should be offered to patients regardless of what type of uh, solution that you will use. But maybe with chlorhexidine, uh, you might would want to see the patient uh, sooner than anticipated, or at least remind the patient about the warning signs of endophthalmitis. Regarding the injecting room, now uh, intravitreal injections, whether you given anti-VGF or steroid implant injections, can be given in theater or a dedicated clean room uh, that meets the international uh, and local infection control guidelines. Uh, to set up a clean room in your department, you will need to contact your local infection control uh, health and safety teams um, to review their international guidelines and review their local guidelines to ensure that you have a safe, clean room where you can actually do this procedure if you're not doing them in theater. Uh, and preferably, uh, you shouldn't be doing any um, uh, uh, unclean uh, procedures in that room, uh, at least not on the day you're given the injection. So make sure uh, that the case, the room is always clean. Uh, so that's uh, all from me. Uh, I hope it's all clear to everyone. Uh, and I'll hand over the stage to the next speaker. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, hello, good evening. So, um, in my presentation, and uh, I will address uh, three main topics, masks and gloves, uh, post-injection management, and the follow-up of post-injection. So, uh, regarding masks and gloves, uh, physician must wear mask and sterile gloves, and this is just a very common norm, and there's uh, no possibility to be not adherent to that. The patient must wear a mask covering the nose and, 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 or a drape. And of course, we need to pay attention in case the patient is wearing a mask to squeeze, you know, the, uh, the iron which is at the nose part uh, in order to maintain the good preservation of possible, you know, droplets, you know, coming from breathing, you know, up to the sterile area. Uh, intravitreal device uh, can be used instead of lit speculum and caliber. Uh, the uh, physician, of course, uh, has to ensure sterility of the periorbital skin with 10% povidone iodine. And uh, prior to uh, the procedure, uh, we need to advise the patient to avoid talking, of course, because, you know, this can create contamination of the sterile area. And uh, while lying down and prior to mask drape placement uh, to uh, avoid that droplets can reach that area. Regarding post-injection management, it is uh, very often practiced to give antibiotics. By reviewing the medical literature, it is absolutely not recommended, either pre- or post-injection, because there's no evidence of any benefit, and moreover, we can uh, increase the risks of possible antibiotic resistance. Regarding follow-up post-injection, patients should be given information about uh, post-operative uh, complications. Of course, uh, it would be great to have uh, a direct contact, so a telephone number to contact in case of symptoms, including increase of redness, eye pain, which is one of the uh, distinguishing symptoms of possible uh, eye infection, vision reduction, of course, or any symptom of possible endophthalmitis. And this is all for my part, and I leave uh, the floor to the next speaker. I will be speaking on behalf of uh, Prasan Rao, who sends his apologies. And uh, we will talk about this excellent flowchart uh, that uh, uh, Prasan Rao uh, uh, devised. Uh, any diabetic patient should have strict control of the uh, blood sugar, blood pressure, lipid levels, renal impairment. We must educate them about uh, the risk of smoking and encourage them to stop. Management of sleep apnea also is very relevant, especially in cases where you find that uh, the macular edema does not resolve in spite of treatment. Diabetic patients should have an OCT. When the uh, macular edema is non center involving, we can continue to observe this patient. And if there is worsening, uh, the patient may undergo a fluorescent angiogram 
uh, and perhaps even laser uh, if this remains outside the center. In center, so uh, patients who uh, uh, are asymptomatic with good vision and uh, macular thickness, central retinal thickness of less than 300 microns can be observed, uh, as we saw from the protocol B study. If the patients have vision worse than 2030 or macular thickness of more central retinal thickness more than 300 microns, and or if they are symptomatic, due to the diabetic macular edema, then these are the patients that we would treat. Now, these patients have already had an OCT, and so if uh, they have vitroretinal traction, then they may uh, be referred to the retinal surgeon and they can undergo vitrectomy with membrane peeling. Patients when there is uh, no uh, epiretinal membrane, we need to uh, look uh, for uh, cases of uh, if they have been previously vitrectomized or pseudophagic, or if they've had a recent myocardial infarction in, or stroke in the previous three months. And this can guide us on how to proceed next. So uh, patients who have had a recent stroke, they can go down to the dexamethasone implant pathway uh, directly, as we heard previously that uh, the uh, drug uh, anti-VEGF is contraindicated in cases with recent uh, myocardial infarction or stroke, so steroid implant becomes very relevant. This is also relevant in patients with previous vitrectomy, as we know the anti-VEGF does not last as long, uh, and also pseudophagic patients we can consider dexamethasone implant. Uh, in uh, patients where there is no vitromacular traction, no recent stroke or MI, uh, and if the patient is not keen for monthly anti-VEGF therapy, and this could be for several reasons, for example, inability to travel, uh, inability to attend uh, on a monthly basis, then once again, we can consider the dexamethasone implant as a first line. Um, Anti-VEGF therapy is initiated if uh, the patient has not had, uh, vitro, uh, doesn't have vitreomacular attraction, has not had recent MI or stroke, and fulfills the vision and central retina thickness uh, guidelines. So anti-VEGF therapy is delivered either in a fixed pattern, uh, PRN pattern, or on a treat and extend pattern, and that is based on the agreement between the physician and the patient. If there is a poor response, then we must consider uh, the systemic comorbidities and how well controlled they are or not. Uh, they could have a fluorescent angiogram or an OCT angiogram to rule out ischemia. Uh, one could consider switching to another anti-VEGF or switching to a dexamethasone implant. In the cases of relapsing diabetic macular edema, we uh, look for evidence of response to prior treatment and if there has been good response, we can continue with the same treatment. If there was poor response, this can, they can be switched to another anti-VEGF or to the dexamethasone implant. Uh, going back to the dexamethasone implant, uh, after treatment, if there is recurrence, then uh, they, if it is uh, greater than four months, this can be uh, repeated. Of course, with any uh, dexamethasone implant, any steroid re response, you must look for a steroid response or IOP rise, and then you may reconsider if this patient should have another uh, steroid implant or if they can be switched to anti-VEGF or laser. If the macular edema uh, recurs in less than three months, then one must discuss with the patient whether they want to have a repeat dexamethasone implant. Some may agree, and you may prefer to continue with the same treatment. If not, uh, and there is recurrence but good response to the steroid treatment, then you can consider the flucinolone implant. But these, uh, and these last for three years, uh, remember to remind uh, or to uh, speak to the patient 
and say that you know they may require the occasional top up with uh, anti vegf or dexamethasone implant so that is uh, uh, all about the flow chart and uh, uh, again i thank uh, prasan rao for devising this uh, excellent flow chart um, and uh, i will end there so uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, dear colleagues, for revising uh, and giving us the highlights of the um, consensus. And I'd like to also uh, to inform you that we have around uh, 91 uh, um, references, uh, which is based on clinical trials, guidelines, and even um, uh, the latest um, updates in, uh, within uh, diabetic macular edema management. Uh, this all resources are in the consensus, which will be to, uh, on your uh, on its way to you uh, within coming uh, weeks, inshallah. And uh, finally, uh, we would like to uh, thank uh, the medical directors and uh, medical writers. And uh, also we have on behalf of uh, the society and authors, we acknowledge the editorial support provided by Bayer. Uh, Bayer, uh, to make it clear, that has no interference in the consensus. And uh, they were only uh, a facilitator uh, that they uh, facilitated for uh, the publication. And they don't have any impact uh, for the consensus development. Uh, or any input uh, on the content. Uh, so this is uh, the last of the uh, consensus. And if you have any question or comment or anything to add for uh, upcoming um, upcoming um, um, initiative, please kindly uh, email us to uh, to myself uh, or Dr. Maysoon Al Karam, and who is going now to moderate uh, the next session, which is Q and A with the experts. Uh, Dr. Maysoon, the floor is all yours. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Nora. Uh, first, allow me to thank as well uh, our steering committee who worked really hard on this consensus, which took over uh, a year of uh, tremendous effort. Uh, as well as I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Bayer who helped us in operating the logistics of this consensus. And uh, let me just welcome my panelists uh, uh, who are as well as steering committee members, uh, which Dr. Nora have introduced at the beginning of this um, session. Uh, I have on my panelist Dr. Patricio uh, Lorenzo, who is a consultant medical retina at Dubai Hospital. I have Dr. Mohamed Abdelnabi, who is a consultant VR at Sheikh uh, Shakhbout Medical City. And I have Dr. Avinash, who is a consultant ophthalmologist at Morfield Eye Hospital in Dubai. Um, we are happy to receive any of your questions uh, if it's related to the DME consensus document or any question related to uh, which might be related to the treatment of DME. I think we have one question uh, here. Uh, I'm publishing this on the screen. Uh, the question, uh, I'll address the question to Dr. Uh, Avinash. Uh, the question is why 300 microns is the cut line to the DME on the OCT? Dr. Um, Avinash? So that, that you know, it, it is a good question because there is no real uh, cutoff, but uh, 300 is, a, is a considered an arbitrary cutoff. Uh, and there's some good reasons why we chose 300. Uh, 300 allows you uh, to have some discretion uh, where you have a little bit of uh, macular edema, but it's not really causing any vision problems. However, above 300, one might expect uh, that uh, the vision can get worse. Uh, machines also have some variability. And so 300, again, uh, accounts for that as well. And there will be some anatomical variation as well. So uh, there is no uh, specific reason why 300, but it's a, in fact a variety of reasons that allow uh, discretion both uh, to treat and not to treat. Uh, however, it uh, gives enough safety that patients who have uh, macular thickness beyond 300 really uh, should be considered more uh, likely to be treated. Thank you very much, Dr. Avinash. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, I'm publishing it on the screen. And uh, I'll have this question goes to Dr. Abdel Nabi. Uh, the question says, one slide had 5% povidine iodine recommendation for intravitreal injection and 10% in another slide. Uh, 
five percent is routine practice. I think it's more of a comment, um, Dr. Abdinabi. Yes, thank you very much. Good question. So the five percent is the uh, before administering the uh, uh, the injection. So you soak the eye with five percent for a period of sixty seconds, and then the cleaning. The cleaning. My understanding is the cleaning is with ten percent. Um, which is a little bit stronger. Um, so uh, we are not using antibiotics anymore. It's uh, the, the uh, betadine, the betadine is, is proven to be uh, a superb anti-infective uh, anti agent. And we use it, uh, I personally use it before and after. Um, so hope, hope this clarifies it. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdinabi. Um, we have one more question here, I'm publishing this and I'm reading it loud with you. 65 years old lady with DME in her right eye. She complains of decreased vision in her right eye. Um, that's probably a case. Uh, I'm not really sure um, uh, what is the question there. So meanwhile, uh, whoever asked this question, if you can kindly elaborate in where is the question? Uh, meanwhile, so, I, mean, uh, I, I think the algorithm uh, is quite helpful in this. If the patient has reduced vision and diabetic macular edema, and they have an OCT, uh, and they have don't have vitro macular attraction, uh, is uh, if they are phakic uh, and no recent MI or stroke, then uh, they may be eligible for treatment with anti VEGF. If contraindicated, then uh, and, and pseudophagic, then uh, maybe uh, with a dexamethasone implant. So the algorithm helps uh, a lot in this, uh, in, in guiding you in managing these cases. So, yep, here we go, some more information. So, pseudophagic in both eyes. So, uh, you know, if she's got reduced vision, pseudophagic, then you have an option of treating uh, with either anti VEGF or dexamethasone implant. Uh, this is, I think, it's more elaboration. Would you consider parafovia retinal thickening of 320 microns as indication for anti VEGF? or you need a uh, central sapphire thickness of 300 microns. Uh, Dr. Avi, as if you've answered the first bit of this question. Uh, so, so this is the, so the 300 uh, uh, central subfield thickness is mainly, these are guidelines. So you have to take in uh, the, all the factors, the vision uh, as well, and the 320 microns, uh, if there is exudate, etc., then it may be reasonable to treat. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Avi. Um, if uh, feel free, please, to ask any question. Um, meanwhile, um, I'll ask a question for Dr. Patricio. Um, as this consensus is like any other guy guideline or consensus which will be eventually required to be reviewed or updated and uh, if we uh, to predict the time frame for review and update of this consensus to reflect obviously a new pharmac pharmacological agent uh, or a new delivery system which is uh, all uh, currently in the pipeline and maybe some of pharmacological agents are currently in the pipeline for uh, maybe AMD or other retinal conditions. Uh, when do you think this guideline will require to be reviewed in anticipation of uh, the treatment coming on board um, soon? So sure. do you think one year, two years? Mm -hmm. And if yes, what a treatment you think is going to make a difference in this guideline? Sure, thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things about the previous questions. In a 65 years old patient presenting with supposedly diabetic macular edema, 
Uh, first thing you have to rule out is that this is not as occult CMV presenting instead of diabetic macular edema. You, so I advise you to get a good scroll up and down looking for a double layer sign or an OCTA to make sure you're dealing with pure diabetic macular edema. Uh, about the updates, um, we, yes, definitely we have on the pipeline several drugs. We already got some registration for age-related macular degeneration. How often, it depends on when these medications are going to be registered and available for treating diabetic macular edema. Uh, one thing is the mechanism of injection that is not going to change. And the other thing, as you can, as you can see, we've been exceptionally aseptic, not pinpointing about which sort of anti-VGF you have to use. Uh, so you can choose any of the available anti-VGF. So being so uh, aseptic for these uh, guidelines, I think that the review could be done uh, in two, let's say, in two uh, baselines. One, as soon as a new medication is available for DME, just to incorporate in the nomogram uh, the chances of uh, using this medication. And the other one is maybe, I would say that every two years, could be more than enough if there is no uh, a big uh, difference in between medications or uh, protocols for injection. Thank you very much, Dr. Patricio. Um, Dr. Abdel Nabi, if you can kindly take this question, any recommendation regarding interval between anti-VGF injection to regress new vascularization and vitrectomy? Uh, yes, uh, this is an excellent question. In fact, uh, um, uh, my recommendation and, and my experience uh, injecting anti-VEGF a few days before a vitrectomy is the uh, um, ideal way. If you inject it far earlier, a week or more, you may cause traction and worsening uh, um, tractional detachments if there are if there is traction already particularly if it, if, it, if it threatens the macula. So in my own practice, I injected two to three days before vitrectomy and not longer. That's the ideal timing. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdel Nabi. Um, Dr. Avinash, if you kindly uh, answer this question, any role for laser and DME nowadays? Um, so, you know, old fashioned laser where we would do grid laser for uh, center involving macular edema is really not recommended. So center involving macular edema, we do not recommend uh, macular laser or traditional ma macular laser. Uh, extrafoveal uh, circinates may either be observed and if they're worsening, you know, one could do a, a small focal laser for extrafoveal circinates if you feel that they are getting worse and may uh, the center involving. Uh, we haven't really uh, discussed uh, micropulse laser because, uh, again, that is not uh, you know, routine practice. And uh, some people do use it, but really is out of the scope of this uh, guideline. So for center involving macular edema, uh, certainly there is no role for uh, focal grid laser. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Avinash. Um, we have more questions here. Um, I will address this question for Dr. <clears throat> Patricio. It was mentioned that steroid challenge can be done by using steroid drops. How long you we try it? Uh, how long do they need to try it prior of? Yeah. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first, you have to use, uh, let's say, a potent steroid uh, medication such as uh, um, prednisolone drops um, and I, I give them with enough uh, frequency, let's say at least four times a day. And I would say that by the week three to four, you will know if this person is a steroid responder. So the ideal, ideal time to check the pressure would be somehow in between three to four weeks. Thank you very much. Uh, as you are on the screen, can you take this question, Dr. Patricio, as well? Can you elaborate on the treatment protocol after loading dose, PRN, or treat and extend? Sure. 
Uh, it depends on the response. I mean, if after the loading doses, uh, the patient, I'm taking for granted that this patient is a, is a good responder. Uh, the macula is, is dry or the macula is practically dry, uh, back to normal anatomy. I personally uh, prefer to go for a treat and extend to decrease the number of injections, but you have a, a person that it is not very keen on injections, is a patient who is complying with the visits, you can go for PRM. In our practice, we usually go routinely for treat and extend. Um, Dr. Patricio, would the pandemic change your view uh, in kind of protocol you treat or bilaterality of the of, of the injection? No, we still don't. I prefer not to treat uh, on the same seat in both eyes. Um, I don't feel comfortable treating both eyes just by by the fear of having a bilateral ophthalmitis. If you treat both eyes, something that, that was not uh, said during the talk, uh, apart from uh, preparing every eye separately, I could go for a different batch of injections, just in case the, the, you use the same batch and the batch is contaminated all, 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 all of them. Thank you very much, Dr. Patricia. I would like to uh, hear from Dr. Avinash and Mohamed Abdel Nabi regarding this particular question, as we are in the spirit of the pandemic. And um, we've made lots of consideration during the pandemic in terms of, uh, which obviously the pandemic has influenced all aspects of our life, and that probably, including the way we manage our patients, we get with, uh, with, with the COVID situation and uh, people restriction of movement between the Emirates, lots of patients uh, were finding it difficult to come on a monthly basis. So will that actually uh, change your approach to the patient uh, in terms of, again, bilateral injection or maybe lean more towards uh, um, panretinal photocoagulation versus, um, you know, uh, or dexamethasone maybe implant rather than monthly injection. So, Dr. Avinash. Um, so, firstly, I, you know, I have no hesitation at all in treating bilaterally, uh, and certainly when you consider, uh, and you know, the, the risk of endosalmitis is the same whether you do one or two. Uh, you know, because if you argue. Uh, but but as we said, the guidelines do allow for us to give bilateral injections, and I have no hesitation. Um, in terms of uh, the uh, pandemic, yes, certainly, again, it reduces the number of visits to the hospital or the patient, uh, so that also helps. Uh, the, the question here says uh, PRN or treat and extend, and, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I use treat and extend for most uh, cases, but you know, really, it is a discussion with the patient, and uh, once you stabilize the patient, then it becomes PRN. I think in diabetes, unlike AMD, where we stick to treat and extend. Uh, dexamethasone implant uh, in uh, because of the pandemic, certainly patients might uh, you know we we do discuss that, and some somebody might a patient might say, uh, you know, I don't want to come. Uh, every month is there a longer acting agent and that has uh, certainly uh, as as long as that they fall within the criteria then i see no reason why we cannot use dexamethasone as first line and then uh, even flucinolone if uh, indicated how far do you extend your patient to dr uh, avi uh, well you know at, at three months in, in diabetes if they are stable, then uh, I switch to PRN because uh, you know we, we assume that the drug is no longer there, and then uh, they can switch to PRN. Dr. Mohamed Abnebi, uh, how yes, is your uh, stake in this? Thank you. Uh, well, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of bilateral injections. Uh, having personally treated uh, uh, somebody who developed uh, bilateral endophthalmitis. Um, but I, I understand the appeal. I understand it's more convenient for the patient, particularly if he or she's coming from a distance. Um, I personally wouldn't have bilateral injections if I needed anti vegf or if I needed intravitreal injection, and that's why I wouldn't recommend it to my patient. 
although I, I do understand that there are situations where uh, patients would uh, uh, would want to have uh, bilateral injections. And I concur with my colleagues that uh, everything should be discussed at length, all the risks, um, all the precautions must be taken, so on and so forth. But I would not, uh, I would not, I would not uh, use bilateral injections. Um, and, and I would compare my colleagues to, I move into treat and extend as opposed to PRN, um, just because of the, the outcome is, is better with treat and extend. And, and uh, although PRN, you know, we've got to depend on the patient turning up and, and patient compliance is an issue. Um, I, uh, I very much like uh, Ozotex implants and I use them a lot and I uh, assess the patient, uh, uh, particularly if they have chronic uh, uh, systolic maculopathy, particularly if there are signs of uh, um, inflammation, uh, which we all know, hyperrefractile uh, uh, spots, some uh, um, patients respond very well to Ozotex. And, and I, um, you know, even patients who have a little bit of cataract, you know, they, they will eventually need cataract surgery. So, you know, whereas if a macular edema doesn't respond um, to treatment and the and, and macular becomes tethered, that's a problem. But the cataract is a 10 minute procedure. So, uh, so, also, it's a very important uh, um, medication or armament. Um, I too use, uh, I do uh, use. Uh, um, uh, Luvian, but Luvian is less, less potent than Ozotex, and the response is not, particularly in chronic macular edema, the response is not as, um, as pronounced as Ozotex, although again, the appeal of having an, uh, an implant for, for two and a half, three years is, is, is there, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, I have more questions here. Uh, I will take this question to Dr. Uh, Patricio. You highlighted the need for frequent IOP monitoring with dexamethasone. How can we deal with this during the challenging situation of the pandemic? Well, now we, we are uh, OPD in Dubai Hospital is COVID free. We are not facing this problem. We usually check the IOP somehow around six weeks post uh, dexamethasone injection, and then we recheck again after three months from the injection. Um, so I, I don't think that it is a very challenging situation. If you only need to check the IOP, you can do it in something like maybe less than one minute. I know you're going to spend a lot of time with your paperwork and electronic medical records, but um, making the right appointment at the right time with distancing and keeping the patient's the slots uh, just running fine on time everyone i don't see it as a very very challenging situation as of as of now how often actually dr patricio will ask your patient to come uh, for iop check as i said i i check we check the iops roughly six weeks after the injection and then the patients are scheduled for a, a, an appointment three months after the injection. So we check, let's say, roughly every six weeks for the first injection. If there is not uh, increased pressure and the patient needs a, a second or a third injection, we check every three months. Thank you, Dr. Patricio. Uh, I have one more question here. Uh, what is the lowest cutoff visual acuity uh, that we think MTVG won't help our DME patient? I'll take this question to Dr. Avi. What is the lowest cutoff visual acuity? So is that uh, good vision or, or bad vision? I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, the. I think I, I, I have a feeling they mean like worst visual acuity where uh, anti-VGF will not help to improve the vision? No, I don't think that uh, that there is a cutoff where you would not treat. Uh, Anti-VEGF, uh, you know, has, we've seen patients with really chronic uh, diabetes with uh, very thick, swollen, really awful looking CT scans with terrible vision, uh, really can respond uh, well. And, you know, you might even have late responders, uh, 
So I, there is no, nobody should not have a trial of treatment. So, uh, you know, uh, why, why deny somebody the op- opportunity to improve if uh, even, even though their uh, vision is bad, they, they're the ones who have the most to gain. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Avi. Um, one more question here. With the risk of diabetic eye complication, how do you prioritize DME patients during a pandemic among this other theoretically more serious conditions? Dr. Mohammed Abdel Nabi? Well, um, you, you know, we all know the uh, morbidity associated with uh, diabetic eye disease. And, uh, um, you know, I, I would, uh, presumably this is compared to other conditions, not just eye conditions. But the, the question is not very clear to me. But I would prioritize uh, uh, treatment of diabetic maculopathy because simply left untreated, then the patient will end up with macular tethering and with uh, chronic macular edema and with, uh, uh, you know, very difficult to treat uh, macular edema. So, yeah, I would make it a priority and, and, and uh, uh, coaching the patient to get uh, stabilize their diabetes and have the treatment as early as possible. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if I've answered the question. Uh, um, I, I think you've answered the question. Thank you, Dr. Mohamed Adnabi. Uh, we have one more question here. Um, why you did not take consider consideration more biomarkers on the OCT in the guideline? Uh, Dr. Patricio? Yeah, of course you can, uh, Dr. Kanaz. Thank you for your question. Of course, you can go in depth with the biomarkers and you can think of starting with esteroids. Maybe if you see hyperreflective spots or, or the like, uh, if you want to go deeper, I would take probably um, the area of the superficial capillary plexus on OCTA. Uh, but in the end, it really doesn't change too much your uh, protocols. We always start with anti-VGF despite um, biomarkers for inflammation. We give a, a, a chance the patient to improve with uh, uh, anti-VGF. And only if the patient is not responding after a loading doses, then you can, as it is in the protocol, in the guidelines, you can think of switching to either another anti-VGF or a dexamethasone implant. Can I follow the question here, if I may? Sure, Dr. Mohammed, go ahead. Okay, so this is to uh, Patricio. Uh, are there, what is your um, uh, criteria for starting with steroids rather than anti Yeah. Um, you start with anti at all, you start with steroids. Right. Uh, the, the, for, for us, the only indication for starting with uh, steroids are basically contraindication for anti-VGF. So if you have a patient who has totally neglected macular edema, uh, a macula that is five, six hundred micron thick, full of hyperrefractile spots and sub, sub-macular, uh, sub, uh, serous macular edema underneath, and, and the patient is, uh, you know, has got neglected diabetes. Is there an argument of starting with, with steroids for that patient? No, no, it's, it's up to you, specifically more so if the patient is uh, maybe pseudophatic. But uh, in our practice, we start with anti-VGF. Sure, thank you. You're welcome. I don't think there is any more question. And um, allow me to thank uh, my panelists and uh, the rest of the steering committee for the hard work. Uh, I'd like to conclude here in thanking our 15 medical retina expert, which was uh, not an easy job to have a 15 medical retina expert who comes from different school to agree in a consensus. Um, uh, giving the fact that uh, in most instances there is no right and wrong, uh, there is evidence and guideline which we relied on, uh, and particularly with the EME, uh, the evidence have been very broad. Uh, 
uh, and lots have showed no superiority of certain treatment or um, uh, uh, on other treatment, which lifts a huge room of uh, for the to for a physician for physician discretion and the management. So I hope this uh, consensus will um, help uh, our uh, colleagues uh, who practice uh, medical retina to make it uh, to give them an, um, a choice uh, choices for treating their patients and to make the management easier for them and as we mentioned earlier uh, this is consensus will eventually be reviewed to reflect any new treatment um, uh, or new guideline uh, and protocols uh, and i think there are lots in the pipeline and um, hope to um, uh, revise this again with the same steering committee. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and have a good, good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you so much.